Hello! Happy Halloween, everyone! At some point in this video, a small black witch is going to fly across your screen. Leave a comment if you see it. Today, we're going to transform this traditional incandescent light bulb into a kind of vintage style decorative LED lamp. And I say only kind of vintage style because there is a spiral of LEDs instead of a filament, plus diodes and resistors are openly visible. Interestingly enough, a tiny spider got inside this prototype and covered everything in cobwebs. Very fitting for the occasion. I think the spider must have known that I would publish this video on Halloween. But then it died a horrible death of starvation, as no other insect was sufficiently dumb to crawl inside the lamp through a tiny hole. May your soul rest in peace, small spider. So first you're obviously going to need your incandescent bulb, and if it's got a branding on top you should be able to remove that using regular household scouring cream. Then you're also going to need the base of some kind of compact fluorescent lamp or an LED lamp, because most likely we'll have to destroy this cap to even get it off the lamp, so we'll just replace it with this one. Then you're obviously also going to need some electronics, that is, if you want to put something in there, but I'm gonna talk about those later. For now, let's start taking apart the lamp. Since I said these screw caps are rarely removable without destroying the bulb, I'm going to take my flush cutters and snip my way around the soft threads of the aluminum cap. We can cut the wires and remove the glue, which is strangely easy now. Then we can break the little glass tube in the middle using a screwdriver and knock out the rest of the stem. Actually, don't remove as much as I did, as I'm gonna have difficulties mounting things later on. The lower round edge should really stay, but since this part already broke out that far, I'll remove it all the way around. I washed out all the white powder, now we have a nice clear bulb for our project. Just be careful not to cut yourself on the sharp edges in the process. Next, we're gonna dismantle the base of our IKEA lamp. Likewise, snip and break away all the plastic till you're left with the cap only. Well, um, slight change of plans. It turns out the cap of this IKEA lamp is also made from plastic, chrome-plated plastic, and while I can solder to it, I don't think epoxy will stick to it, and since we were going to use epoxy to assemble the lamp, we're not going to use this. Oh, and it actually doesn't even fit. So instead, we're just going to steal ourselves a much more aesthetically fitting cap from another lamp, which we don't really need the glass of. And yes, I said, it's almost impossible to remove the cap without destroying the glass. However, since today is Halloween, we're not going to destroy the glass either. We're just going to use some Halloween magic to remove the cap. And basically the way you do this is by carefully covering the base of the lamp in cobwebs, of which I fortunately don't have very many around here, then you just murmur an incantation and it just pops off like so. Only joking, of course. So the way you actually do it is by soaking the lamp in water for at least two days, and then you can use a pair of vice grips to carefully squeeze the cap from all sides until it actually pops off. Just like the rest of the internet, apparently, I really didn't know water is actually enough to loosen the cement used on these bulbs until I discovered it by accident. So please share this video to make everyone know an easy way to remove the cap from an incandescent light bulb they hopefully don't use in their homes anymore. So now we've got a housing that actually fits together, we're gonna need some electronics to put inside. The circuit we're gonna use is actually very simple, it basically just consists of a couple of resistors sharing the power dissipation, four diodes acting as a full bridge rectifier, and ten LEDs wired in series. Now it is pretty important that you use proper quarter watt resistors as opposed to these dinky tiny ones, because I designed this circuit to run the resistors at almost their full 250 milliwatt power dissipation to maximize the current going through the LEDs without using too many resistors. And even still the LEDs only get about 5 milliamps each, which is part of the reason why this lamp is solely decorative. But enough science for now, let's go and collect the components we're gonna need. If you've already watched some of my videos, you'll know that first and foremost, I always use salvaged components, and that's exactly what we're doing this time as well. First, we get two 2.2K resistors, then four 10K ones. Four identical 1N407 diodes do the rectifying, and lastly, we need 10 of these warm white SMD LEDs. 
So about these LEDs, yes, they are standard 20 milliamp SMD LEDs, which is the other reason for the lamp being only decorative. Actually, I don't recommend using these 30, 40 and footprint LEDs at all because their structural integrity only relies on some sort of plastic, which kind of makes them melt very quickly while soldering, plus they snap in half quite easily. I think much better would be to use some kind of smaller footprint like the 0805 and the 0603. Yes, these are more difficult to solder, but they shouldn't melt because they are constructed quite differently. So first we're going to make the rectifier. Before I start I need to straighten out the leads of my nice salvage diodes, then I bend the anode in a 90 degree angle on two of them and the cathode on the other two. Using the helping hands to rig everything up for soldering is more or less mandatory since you would get pretty bad burns trying to hold everything in place. Anyway, we take a diode of either variety of bent pin and stick them together with a nice blob of solder. Then we do the same thing with the remaining diodes. The result looks something like this. Now we bend the opposite pins in a way that we can connect the leftover anodes and cathodes from each stack. This creates the positive and the negative connection of the rectifier. It's really quite tricky to get everything to line up, but once it does we can put on some solder before it pings apart again. One side done, bend the other one till it sits kinda straight and snip off every excess of the pins. Now it should look like this. To the left we have the positive and the negative output of the rectifier and to the right the AC input. Next I'm gonna add the 10k resistors. As you might have noticed I not only use salvaged resistors first, but specifically all salvaged resistors with the shortest leads. One of them goes on the positive side of the rectifier, another one on the negative. Naturally you need to make sure none of the solder joints are touching, otherwise I guarantee you a nice bang as soon as you plug the lamp in for the first time. To solder the remaining 10k resistors to the AC input of the rectifier, we need to cut off these leads as regrettable as it is. Then rig everything up again to throw on more solder. Usually I really don't splash out on solder like this, but with the camera in front of my face I really can't get close enough with my head to properly see what kind of solder joint I'm producing, so more solder is probably gonna make up for it. Now we have a rectifier with resistors on both sides. Next we're going to attach the 2.2k resistors to the DC side. Note that these resistors do have one long pin, which in this case we want to point away from the whole rectifier assembly. Later the LED spiral will attach to these leads. Now let's put it aside and turn our attention to the LEDs. We'll need some 25 or 26 gauge enameled copper wire. I can't really make out which of them I have here, but that doesn't matter. From that wire we're gonna cut 9 30mm long pieces which are going to make up the LED spiral. So if you want to have less turns, just make the pieces shorter or vice versa. All these pieces of wire now need to be tinned on both ends. I just use the soldering iron to melt off the insulation. Takes some time, but you can do it the way you prefer. Note that some wires are more temperature resistant than others, depending on where you get them from. With all the wires tinned, it's time for the LEDs. Like I said, the ones I'm using are less than ideal, but I still have a thousand of them because they were cheap. Either way, the best approach seems to be to clamp them in the tweezers like this and then very quickly dab on a blob of solder. Any lingering with the soldering iron will absolutely melt the framework of the LED. Then position the wire and carefully flow it together. The anode is even more sensitive to heat because the tiny metal plate it consists of hasn't as much surface area sticking to the plastic, consequently melting it far quicker and ripping off the bonding wire. That should be good, let's see if it still works. Yep, we can do the next one. By the way, I'm working with 0.5mm 6040 lead based solder and a very thin soldering tip. The entire design of this lamp is very much inspired by Clive from BigClive.com, so credits to him if you think it looks nice, though I think only we tech nerds like to see the entrails of our interior decoration. This one looks good as well, so let's do a nice macro shot of the next one so you can better see what I'm doing. I always do the cathode first and then the easiest way is to put the end of the solder down on the pad of the LED and kind of flatten it with a soldering tip which makes it melt on quite quickly. Take the wire, put it on top and flow it together. Looks juicy. Now the positive. I'm gonna do this one at an angle so you can see it from the side. Incidentally, you also get a nice close-up view of the tiny hole I cut in my finger while making supper last week. I really hope this video doesn't get demonetized for that. 
And with all 10 LEDs done, we have a short and very fragile fairy light string. Let's see if it still works. Which it does perfectly fine. And I didn't even destroy a single LED. Now, before I move on to the final assembly, we're going to fabricate a small plastic insulator, which is ultimately going to hold the electronics inside the lamp. And to do that, I'm going to use this piece of red plastic from an old toy. I don't really know what kind of plastic this is. Keep in mind, epoxy doesn't stick to all kinds of plastic, but apparently it did stick to that stuff on the prototype, so we're just gonna use it again. This insulator should be marginally longer than the opening of the bulb is wide and have two holes in the middle for the leads of the resistors. Now with this done I can solder some longer wires to the resistors, which you won't need if you use some with long leads. Note that on one side I'm using 22 gauge single core copper wire and just two twisted very thin strands for the other one. Now we can slide on the insulator and fix it on the strong side with a drop of super glue. Next, we need to do quite a lot of fumbling to get the electronics to sit adequately centered in the glass bulb, which is generally easier if the rim of the bulb is still intact. With that done, I can crop the leads of the DC resistors to a length, where the LED spiral will also sit vertically centered inside the bulb. Talking about the LED spiral, I'm gonna carefully coil our miniature fairy light string around a pen that fits easily through the opening in the glass. If some of the LEDs end up pointing in the wrong direction, you can twist the wire using a pair of pliers to get them straight. Just don't try twisting the LED itself or it'll be toast. After pulling the pen out of the coil, we can arrange the windings till everything looks nice and solder them to the resistors. Make sure to double check the polarity of the rectifier beforehand, which I completely forgot to do and by fluke I actually got it the right way round. Next, we got some more arranging to do to make the entire thing fold up like a Chinese-style paper fan in order for Rust to actually get it inside the lamp. That looks almost straight enough. Actually, let's adjust it a little. And so we've almost reached the final assembly. This, of all, is now the time to do some testing just to make sure that if it really wants to go bang, it'll go bang before you go the extra length of putting inside the glass bulb. That way you have at least the glass left for your next attempt. In preparation, it's also a good idea to again double check the entire circuitry to make sure everything's connected the right way around, because if, for example, one LED is wired in the wrong way around, it'll just burn out. And it's always annoying to see all your hard work go up in a puff of smoke. So here's the easiest and safest way to test things like that, not necessarily the way I do it all the time, but you're going to need a cable with a plug on one end and a screw terminal on the other, as well as some kind of jar with naturally a plastic lid. Just screw it in the terminal block, put your test circuitry into the jar, somehow jamming on the lid, another reason for using plastic lid, and now, theoretically, once I plug it in, it should light up without going bang. Let's see if it does. Yes, it lights up as expected. So this was our test successful, I did not electrocute myself, so let's go mix up some epoxy to finish up the lamp. To begin with, I'll just do a very small batch to permanently attach the resistors to the insulator. Turns out the convenient double syringe is not very convenient at all when it comes to very small quantities. Now we'll have to wait for the glue to harden, which is now, and we can make sure everything will still be centered once we are ready to glue it in. Mix up a bigger quantity of epoxy, put a blob on both ends of the insulator and carefully slide it into the bulb. I guess I'll just have to hold it like that until the resin hardens because the jagged edge of the glass is so uneven it won't stay centered otherwise. Luckily the epoxy only takes one minute to set. It is now the next day, the epoxy has fully cured and we've got exactly three things left to do before we can finally glue on the cap. First of which would be to introduce a screwdriver to kind of bend apart these resistors in order to get a nice splayed coil of pseudo filament. Second, we're going to test it one last time just to make sure it still works after we poked around in it, which it still does. And third, we're going to drill a small hole into the cap close to the edge. Originally, the second wire on these bulbs was soldered to the cap, however, since they are made from aluminum, this solder joint usually just pops off, so we're going to replace it with a small kind of copper rivet to which solder will actually stick. I'm going to cut off this piece of copper wire with the same diameter as the hole I just drilled, 
stick that into the chuck of the drill press, spin it up and squish it on the flat side of a hammer. I don't know what this shaping method is called, assuming it actually exists, but it creates a nice nail head kind of shape, which will act as the head of our rivet. Then slide it into the hole from the outside, cut off the excess and smash the tail to prevent it from slipping out. And as you can see now, we have a nice small copper inlay, or whatever you might call it, to which we can solder without problems. Back to the soldering bench, we just need to clean up the other solder joint to get a hole through which we can poke the solid core wire. Then bend the thin wire so it can sneak out between the glass and the cap and check if everything fits correctly, which it does in this case, so we can mix up the biggest batch of epoxy yet. This is actually going to be really stressful because I literally only have one minute to apply the glue and assemble the lamp before it cures. Thickly coat the leftover cement all the way around and maybe, nope, it's already curing, let's quickly put it together. The screw cap just got really warm and now it's solidified. That's crazy. Anyway, this rubber band should be enough to clamp it till tomorrow. By the way, if you accidentally smear the bulb with epoxy, you can still wipe it off in its fresh green state using rubbing alcohol. Again a day later, let's quickly do the two last solder joints. I'm going to neatly fold the thin wire over the copper rivet and snip off the excess of the thick wire. Strip the part that sticks out of the lamp and flow a blob of solder onto the copper rivet. Cut off the excess and do the same with the other solder joint, except this time we're going to reflow the solder to make the pointy tip disappear. And with that done, our kind of vintage LED lamp is completed! Well, I guess now I just have to demonstrate it working in a real lamp socket, so let's put it in my nice vintage brass socket to try it out. And there you are. It didn't explode. While this video did get a little longer than I expected, there still are a few things I'd like to mention. First of all, these lamps are kind of fragile due to the LEDs being suspended on a piece of wire, so they shouldn't get knocked around too badly. Second, I'm obviously very happy to have discovered a way to remove the cap from incandescent light bulbs without destroying either of them. And it wasn't just a happy incident because I did it on three lamps to test it and it worked on all of them even though they were different models. And you will find a link to download the exact same schematic in the video description so you can build one of these lamps yourself. Naturally, if you're not used to working with mains voltage, don't even try it even though they're Theoretically, shouldn't be much of a risk due to the entire thing being encapsulated in the pre-made housing. By the way, if you saw the witch flying across your screen, do leave a comment down below, but don't put a timestamp. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, you might like this one as well. I really hope you got a spooky Halloween, and I'll see you next time.